Okay, today we start with uh, lecture 35, which is our second lecture on chapter 28. Chapter 28 is our first chapter on uh, magnetism, and here are the main ideas we have covered in the last lecture. We started with a review of basic magnetism, then we considered the magnetic force on the charged particle. We saw that it is given by uh, this equation here, involves the charge, velocity, and the magnetic field uh, acting on the particle. And then we considered the concept of cross fields, where we have a region of space in which we have electric and magnetic fields that are perpendicular to each other, and we send a charged particle with its velocity uh, perpendicular to both fields, and we examined the subsequent motion of the particle in such a region. Today we start with section uh, 28.4, in which we consider a circulating charged particle. To study this topic, we will first review a very important type of motion that we studied back in Physics 101, and that is uniform circular motion. In uniform circular motion, a particle moves in a circle with constant speed. The force acting on the particle always points toward the center of the circle, and therefore it is called a centripetal force. The velocity is constant in magnitude, but of variable direction, and the velocity is perpendicular to the force acting on the particle. And this force does no work on the particle. Now if you look at these features of uniform circular motion, you will find that they fit perfectly the description of the magnetic force. The magnetic force is perpendicular to the velocity and it doesn't do any work like we discussed in the last lecture. So if you send a particle into a magnetic field with its velocity perpendicular to the field, then it will execute a uniform circular motion. So here we consider a particle of charge Q. Here is the particle injected with velocity V into a region, uh, this is the region of magnetic field. The magnetic field, as you can see from the process, is going into the page. So we uh, consider a particle of charge Q injected with velocity V into a region of magnetic field P with the velocity of the particle perpendicular to the field. The field, uh, the field is into the page. Okay, here is the field. It's into the page, and here is the velocity of the particle. So they are perpendicular to each other. The magnetic force will deflect the particle. Okay, what is the magnetic force? Q, V, cross V. So here is uh, V, it's into the page, and here is V. Okay, here are the two vectors. V cross V is upward. So we have the particle initially going into a straight line, along the straight line. Once it gets into the field, there will be an upward force pushing it up that will bend it and make it follow a circular path. And that is the magnetic force. In this case, since the particle is moving in a circular path with constant speed, because the magnetic force does not change the magnitude of the velocity, then it will move in uniform circular motion with the magnetic force acting as the centripetal force. And what we want now is, from this simple equality that we have here, we want to derive the properties of this kind of motion. So, let us do that. So, we start by equating the magnetic force to, we equate it to the centripetal force. What do we have? The magnetic force, Fb, is equal to Qv cross B, whose magnitude is equal to Qvb sine of theta. Now, we said that, as you can see in here, 
the velocity is perpendicular to the field. The angle between them is 90 degrees. Sine of 90 is 1. So the magnetic force is equal to U B multiplied by B. The centripetal force is like we defined it back in physics 101. It is M V squared divided by R. So we can cancel this square with this speed and immediately get the equation for the radius of the circuit in which the particle moves. And that you can see from here is equal to mv divided by q times v. Here is the radius of the circuit. With it, we can now calculate the period. The period, as you remember, is the time to make one full circuit. And that is equal to the circumference of the circle divided by the speed. So this is equal to 2 pi uh, over V multiplied by R, which is mV over QV. So canceling the V, you can see that the period of motion of the charged particle is equal to T is equal to 2 pi m divided by qb. This is the period of the motion. And you can see that it is independent of the speed of the particle. With the period, we can now calculate the frequency, how many cycles are made by the particle per second. The frequency is the reciprocal of the period. So that is QB divided by 2 pi m. And with it, we can now calculate the angular frequency, which is 2 pi times f. And that would be equal to, multiply this by 2 pi. So the 2 pi will cancel. And this is QB divided by m. So here, we have all the properties of the motion of the particle. And we put all of them by equating the magnetic force with the centripetal force. Finally, what happens if we send the particle with its velocity making an angle? This is the situation we discussed here. Here is the uh, velocity. The magnetic field is into the page. The velocity is perpendicular to the magnetic field. So we saw that it will follow a circular path. What if, so this is the situation we discussed. What if we send the particle with its velocity making an angle with the magnetic field other than 90 degrees? In that case, we end up with what we call a helical path, okay? This is a helical path, like a spring. And then instead of just having one circle, like the case where V is perpendicular to V, now we have an infinite number of circles. The particle will move in a circular path, and in addition to that, it will move like in this case in the x direction. So that's a helical path, and that's what happens if the velocity is not perpendicular to the magnetic field. So this is the third topic we have today, a separating a charged particle. Next, we move to the second topic we have today, which is section 28.6, and that is the magnetic force on a current carrying wire. Okay, so here we have to understand what we are doing here. We have a wire carrying a current and we place it in an external magnetic field. What force will be exerted by the field on the wire? So let's first introduce the concept and then go into the details of calculation of the force. Let's consider a wire, that is this picture here, start here. Consider a wire placed in an external magnetic field. This is the region where we have the magnetic field, and as you can see, the field is out of the page. If there is no current passing in the wire, the wire will not deflect when you place it in the magnetic field. It will keep as a straight wire. Now, if you pass a current, like in these two situations, if you pass a current in the wire, the wire will deflect, rightward or leftward, but it will deflect because of the passage of the current in the wire placed in an external magnetic field. If you reverse the direction of the uh, current, 
the deflection will be reversed. And instead of right word, it will become left word. So here we have two questions. Why is the deflection? Because of the current, why is the deflection? And second, how is the direction of the deflection determined? Let's answer the first one. The first one is easy to see. We have seen that if you take a charged particle, place it in a magnetic field, the magnetic field will exert a force on it, which is equal to QV cross V. Now, what is the meaning of a current? Current means we have charges at motion, or charges in motion. So when you have a current, you have charges passing in the wire. These charges will pass in the region where we have the magnetic field. The magnetic field will exert the force on them, and that force will deflect them. The total deflection of all the charges is the deflection we see for the wire. Now, how is the direction determined? Let's, for example, look at let us look at this current in here, okay? The current is going up. Now remember what we said in chapter 26. This is the conventional current. The real current, the electrons are going in the opposite direction. So if we want to understand this one, here we have the magnetic field coming out of the page, and the current is upward, so the electrons are moving down, okay? And now carry out the cross product. It's uh, V cross B, V cross B, but now the electrons are negative, so reverse direction, and that will be to the right as we have it in here. If you reverse the direction of the current, the direction of the velocity of the electrons will also uh, reverse. So what we want to do now is to find the magnetic force acting on the wire, okay? For that, we consider first a straight wire, okay, a straight wire without any bending, a straight wire that's placed in a uniform constant magnetic field, and we want to find, of course, the, the wire will deflect, we want to find the force acting on the wire due to the magnetic field, we want to have an equation that enables us to calculate the magnitude of the force and the direction of the force. So let's go through that derivation. So this is now section 28.6 and here we are considering the magnetic force on a wire, of course a current carrying wire. It has to have a current in it. So in this case We, this is the wire with the current. The current is going up, so the electrons are moving down with a velocity that is equal to the drift velocity that we derived in chapter 26. And here is the magnetic field. These green dots are the magnetic field lines. They are coming out of the page. So we consider a length, consider a length, L of the wire. And that's the length we are considering. And let's see what happens in this length. The electrons will drift, as you can see, with a drift velocity VD, and therefore the amount of charge, the amount of charge passing this section L in time T is given by Q is equal to I times T, the basic definition of the current. Current is charge per unit time, so charge is the product of the current and the time. And this is equal to I times L divided by VD. Very simple relationship. Distance is equal to time multiplied by speed, so the time is distance over the speed, okay? That's the uh, charge. Now, this charge, this charge is subjected, is subjected to 
a magnetic force, okay, the charge will find itself in a magnetic field. So it will experience a magnetic force. And as you can see here, we don't have to worry about the directions because the velocity is down, the magnetic field is out, okay? So that's the situation uh, we have. And that magnetic force, Fb, is equal to Q times Vd times V times sine of phi. Okay, where we use the magnetic force is Qv cross B. Okay, here is Q. The velocity now is the drift velocity. There is the magnetic field, and phi is the angle between B and B. In this case, the angle is 90 degrees. Okay, B is here and B is out. But in the more general case, it could be at any direction. So we take care of that by sine of phi. Now, let us substitute for Q from here into here. And if we do so, this will be equal to Q is I L over V D multiplied by V D B sine of phi. So canceling V D, you can see that the force on this section of the wire is equal to I L B sine of phi. Okay, so here is the magnitude of the force we are looking for. Now, for the special case, if B is perpendicular to the current, okay, like we have it in here, the magnetic field is out of the page and the current is, is upward. In that case, phi is equal to 90 degrees, sine of phi is equal to 1, and therefore the force simply is equal to I L multiplied by B. In the more general case, where the angle is not 90, we define a new vector, which we call the length vector. Okay? It's a vector whose magnitude is equal to the length of the wire, and whose direction is the direction of the current in the wire, the conventional current, not the electrons. The conventional current. So if we define that, define L to be a vector whose length is equal to the length of the wire and whose direction is the direction of the current in the wire. With that now, we can write this equation here more compactly as Fb is equal to I L cross B. And this is the equation that we will use to find the magnetic field on the wire. Okay? First, identify the vector L. It's the length of the wire in the direction of the current. And then take its cross product with the magnetic field. And that will tell you, using the right hand rule, that will tell you the direction of the force and also the magnitude of the force. But let us not forget. What conditions did we have in here? This equation is the equation for the magnetic force on a straight wire in a uniform magnetic field. So these are two conditions here. Straight wire and uniform magnetic field. Okay? What if these conditions are not satisfied? What if I have a wire that is bent? It's not straight, bent, like we have in here. Here is a bent wire. Or the magnetic field is not uniform, it's not constant. Then how do we deal with this equation? Well, in that case, like we have seen many times before, you divide the wire into small elements of length. Here is one of them, exaggerated. So this is a small element of length delta L. And we choose it small enough so that we can consider it to be straight. If it is not straight, keep dividing smaller and smaller until you are satisfied that that section is straight and the magnetic field over that section can be considered uniform. 
and then find the differential force acting only on that segment, which will be, according to this equation, it will be I dL cross B, only over dL. The total force will be the integral over the whole length of the wire. So it will be I integral of dL cross B, which is the generalization of this equation in here. Now, if the magnetic field is uniform, so we have a bent wire, but in a uniform magnetic field, you can take the magnetic field out of the integral. Okay, here is the integral, and the magnetic field is outside it. Now, if in addition to this, you have a, magnet, uh, a uniform magnetic field and a loop, a closed loop, so the wire closes on itself, what will happen to this integral? This will be zero, because the initial and final points in the integral will be the same, so it will integrate to zero and therefore the magnetic force will be zero. With that, we come to this very important conclusion that says the magnetic force on a closed loop in a uniform magnetic field is zero. A very important result that we'll make use of in the next lecture. So the magnetic force on a closed loop in a uniform magnetic field is zero. So that's the uh, material we have today, we dealt with two topics today, a circulating charge and the force on a current carrying wire. Let's now look at some problems and examples related to the material we have. And we will start here with some problems on uniform circular motion and then some problems on uh, forces on current carrying wires. Let's look at a checkpoint three. A checkpoint three says the figure shows a the circular paths of two particles that travel at the same speed in a uniform magnetic field B, which is directed into the page. One particle is a proton, the other is an electron. So we have these two particles coming together. One is a proton, the other one is an electron. We let them enter this region where we have a magnetic field going into the page. And what happens is they split. One of them follows a small circle, the other one follows a larger circle. So the first part of the problem says, which particle follows the smaller circle? With the radius of the circle, we have seen it in here, it's equal to mv over qb. Okay, let's see what is the same. An electron and proton have the same charge, it's the same magnet magnetic field, and they enter with the same speed, okay, there it is. So what is the only difference between the two? It is the mass of the particle. We know that the proton is heavier, so it will follow the larger circle, R will be larger, so it will follow the larger circle. And therefore, this is the circle of the proton, and that is the circuit of the electron. What is he looking for? The smaller circuit. Well, the smaller circuit will belong to the electron. Okay, now, does that particle in part A, we know now that it is the electron, does that particle travel clockwise or counterclockwise? Well, let's see the directions now. Here is the electron coming this way. That is its velocity, and the magnetic field is into the page. So the moment it enters the magnetic field, this is the situation of these two vectors, okay? Here is the velocity, and here is the magnetic field. Now the magnetic force is Q, V cross V. So carry out the cross product. V cross V is upward, but remember that the electron is negative, so you have to multiply this by minus one, the magnetic force is downward, okay? So what will happen is we have the electron coming in a straight line. As soon as it gets into the field, there will be a downward force pushing it this way. So it will follow a clockwise path as it moves in the magnetic field. And therefore the answer is uh, the direction of motion of the electron in the magnetic field is clockwise. Next, let us look at this uh, sample problem example from the book. 
which is about a very important uh, constituent that is the mass spectrometer. The mass spectrometer is a device, an instrument that is used to measure the masses of, uh, of atoms, which are extremely small, as you, you know. So here is the concept of the mass spectrometer. A source of ions, here is a source of ions, so you basically extract one or two electrons, outer electrons from the atom, so it becomes an ion. You do that by heat, you do it by an electric field, by any means you create this ion, and you let the ions get out of this source, this is the source where you create the, the ions, they get out of this source with very small speed, you can say almost stationary. Okay, so a source of ions S emits, sends ions with the charge plus Q, which are then accelerated by a potential difference V. So the ion will get out, find itself in this potential difference, and therefore, like we studied in chapter 24, the potential difference will accelerate the ion. So it will attain a very high speed. You give it that high speed, and then you let it enter through this slit in here, you let it enter into a region where we have a uniform magnetic field, for example, in this case, coming out of the edge. So the ions then enter a chamber in which a uniform magnetic field B is perpendicular to the path. The velocity is up, the magnetic field is out of the page. So the two vectors are perpendicular to each other. What will happen? As we studied at the beginning of this lecture, the ion, the charged particle, will follow a circular path. So the magnetic field causes the ions to move in a semicircle, striking the photographic plate. That is this orange slit in here. That's a photographic plate. It's a sensitive material. If it is hit by a charged particle, it will make a spot at that point. So you know where the particle hit the plate. So, uh, the ion strikes a photographic plate at a distance x from the entry slit. It will enter from this point, and where it hits the plate is a distance x from the entrance. Suppose, for example, that we set the magnetic field to be 80 millitesla. We set the acceleration voltage to be 1000 volts. Let's say that the charge of the ion is 1.16 to the minus 19, so basically, you took an atom and you took only one electron. That's what we have here. And you measure the distance x, find it to be 1.6254 meters. Given this, what is the mass of the ion? So that's what we want. We want this instrument to determine the mass of the ion. Now, in such a problem, we will break it into two parts. The first part is the acceleration part. That's chapter 24. And the second part, is the magnetic field part that's our subject today. So let's start first with the acceleration part. The acceleration part, before the particle gets into the magnetic field, we apply basically the uh, conservation of mechanical energy, as we studied it in chapter 24, you equate the kinetic energy to the potential energy. Of course, the absolute values of these. So you have one half mv squared, and the potential energy is the charge multiplied by the potential. So from here, you get the speed of the ion before it gets into the field, the magnetic field, and that is equal to 2 qv divided by m under the square root. So we have this particle moving with this speed into the magnetic field. Now let us consider what happens in the magnetic field. In the magnetic field, like we saw today, it will move in a circular path of radius mv over qb. So the radius of the path is equal to m v over qb. Let's now substitute. r is what? This is x. How much is that? That is equal to 2r. So r 
is equal to x over 2. Okay. R is equal to x over 2. That is equal to m over qb. And then we substitute for v from here into here. That is 2qv divided by m under the square root. So let's square both sides. x squared over 4 is equal to m squared over q squared, b squared, and then 2qv divided by m. Do we have cancellation? Yes. This q will cancel the square, and this m will cancel the square here. Remember what we are looking for? The mass of the ion. So from here you can see that the mass of the ion, that's this one, uh, is equal to Q B squared X squared, Q B squared X squared, divided by 2 times A, uh, 4 is A, and then we have the acceleration potential. Now substitute the values. Q is given 1.16 to the minus 19, the magnetic field, 80 millitesla. Okay. Uh, X is 1.6254, that's given. The acceleration potential is 1000 volts. Put all of these in here, and you will find that the mass of this particular ion is equal to 3.386 times 10 to the minus 25 kilograms. Okay, an extremely small mass, you can never measure it with an ordinary balance. So here we use magnetic techniques to measure the mass of the atom. So we have these two problems on circulating charges, the chip point and the mass spectrometer. Now let's move into the second concept we have today, which is uh, the magnetic force on our air. And we start here with a chip point uh, four, which says that the figure shows a current I through a wire in a uniform magnetic field B as well as the magnetic force FB acting on the wire. So it is a little bit twisted problem. Usually we know the current and B and we find the force. Here it is the other way around. You are given the current and the force and you are requested to find the magnetic field. So the problem says the field is oriented so that the force is maximum. In what direction is the field? Well, you know that the uh, cross product, the result of the cross product, is perpendicular to the two vectors. So if I is that way and F is this way, it means that the uh, magnetic field has to be along the y direction. Okay? It has to be along the y direction. Now, is it positive y or negative y? Let's see. Here is the current, okay? And the, the, the force is coming out of the page. Now, let's say that the magnetic field is in the positive y direction. What do we have? According to that equation, it's L cross B. L is the direction of the current. So here is L cross B. That will give me a force that goes into the page. That's not what they have here. So let us reverse the magnetic field. Let's have it in the negative y direction, like in here. Okay, now do I get the force given there? Well, in this case, if I hold it this way, okay, where is L? L is there and B is downward. So L cross B will give me a magnetic force that is out of the page, which is exactly what they have in here. Now, if the magnetic field is anywhere in this plane, the force will still be in the z direction. So where exactly is the magnetic field? Well, you can see that there is an angle between them. As the angle increases, you have to put less magnetic field, okay? The angle will help the magnetic field. So if we are looking for the maximum force, we should have the maximum angle between the current and the field and that means the angle is 90 degrees and that means the magnetic field is in the negative y direction.
So that's a conceptual problem on this uh, concept here. Let's now look at sample problem 2806, which is again about the magnetic force on a current carrying wire. And the problem here says, a straight horizontal copper wire, okay? We have a copper, a copper wire like this one, and it is horizontal. It's not vertical, it is horizontal. So, a straight horizontal link of copper wire has a current I of 28 amperes through it. So, you look at it this way, okay? This is the way we are looking at it. The current is going that way. So, as you look this way, you will see the current coming toward you. That's what we have here. And that is the cross-section of the wire. Okay, what are the magnitude and direction of the minimum magnetic field needed to suspend the wire that is to balance the gravitational force on it, given that the mass per unit length of the wire is 46.6 grams per meter? And here is the idea. The wire is this way. If we leave it, the gravitational force will pull it down and it will fall. We want to hang it in the air. One way to do it is to produce a magnetic force that points upward to balance the gravitational force, which is downward. Now, that necessitates that we put a magnetic field to produce that magnetic force. Well, where should be the direction of the magnetic field to give us an upward force? Well, let's look at it this way. This is the length of the wire, and that is the magnetic field, okay? Here is the magnetic field. You can put it anywhere in there, and if you do so, applying the equation we have there, I L cross V, here is L along the current, and here is B, L cross B will be upward. But what we want here is the minimum magnetic field. Again, here is the angle phi between L and B. If you increase the angle, you will put less field. If you decrease the angle, you have to put more field. So the minimum field is this way, where the magnetic field is perpendicular to the wire. That will make the angle 90 degrees, sine of that is 1. So the minimum magnetic field will be in that direction, perpendicular to the wire. And now you can see L, is, it's coming out of the page, L cross B will give me a magnetic force that points upward, and we want that force to balance the gravitational force. So what should be the magnetic field? Okay, so we now equate the two forces after this uh, discussion of the, uh, of the direction of the field. We want the magnetic force to be equal to the gravitational force in magnitude, otherwise they are uh, uh, opposite to each other. What is the magnetic force? Here it is. It's I L times B. We said that they must be perpendicular, so the angle is 90, sine of that is 1, and this is equal to M times G. So the required magnetic field is equal to, just bring these here, M over L, M over L, multiplied by G divided by I. M over L is the mass per unit length that is given in here. So let us put that. That will be equal to 46.6. It changed the grams into kilograms, 10 to the minus 3. And then G is 9.8. The current passing in the wire is 28 amperes. So if we put all of these, you will find that the required magnetic field can be obtained from this angle here. And here we have uh, the second example on the magnetic force on a current carrying wire. And that brings us to the end of our class today, the second lecture in chapter 28, where we discuss circulating charged particles and the magnetic force on a current carrying wire.